All right. Well, good morning, Central Church. It has been such a joy to be here with you and to worship this morning. And uh, this is second service, so I'm one service into preaching this already, and I'm, I'm ready to go. I hope you are too. <clears throat> My voice might be given out on me at this point, but that's because this passage is so rich, and it's been so cool to spend some time already working through the magnificent truths that God outlines for us in this passage, specifically how they intersect with each one of our lives. And so, uh, as we gather this morning, if you've been with us, you know that we've been following Pastor Matt and the central team from afar as they are in Israel experiencing the gospel in 3D. That's the name of the series. And uh, as we've been following them along, this week we get to two important locations. First, Caesarea Maritima, and then second, Antioch. And this is going to be a really cool moment for us in our study because Antioch is the place from which God began the global expansion of the gospel through a church, the church that had gathered there in Antioch. And so that's what we're going to see this morning as we consider what it means to be a missional church, that is a church of spirit-empowered gospel proclaimers who are sent out to this community and the world, we're going to see three characteristics in the church at Antioch that we must foster here at Central Church, collectively as a body, but also individually in our own individual walks with Christ. Three characteristics. We must be a church and a people that are marked by a deep trust in God's sovereignty, who hear the Spirit's call and who prioritize their lives around Christ's great commission. So let's turn to Acts 12, starting at verse 20. And we're going to see that this morning. Stand with me as we read the Word of God. Acts 12, 20 through 13, 3. It says, Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country depended on the king's country for food. And on an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down, because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Church, this morning we are going to see that God purposes and provides for His church to take his salvation to the ends of the earth. Whereas the gospel spread initially slowly through the scattering of of, uh, believers at the persecution of Stephen, we're going to see here in the church at Antioch, the church first begin to obey Christ's great commission. And central, my prayer this morning is that it would be said of us that we are like the church in Antioch. May it be said of us that we obeyed, that we sent May God bless the reading and the preaching of His Word. You can be seated. Church, this morning, three characteristics. The first that we are going to see is that a church on mission trusts in God's sovereignty. We see that initially in uh, verses 20 to 23. Read them with me. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon when they came to him with one accord And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, 
because their country depended on the king's country for food. And on an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Before we take one step further in this passage, can we just acknowledge that's a bad day? This is a bad moment in the life of Herod, a bad moment in the life of all those who aspired to be like Herod, gods in and of themselves. But through it all, we are going to see God's sovereignty. And we're going to be invited into trusting in God's sovereignty. To set the context for us this morning, Luke has already shaped for us an image of Herod. So we learn in Acts 12, 1 to 3, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And when Peter was freed by an angel of the Lord, Herod was so infuriated that he went for the sentries who were in charge of guarding uh, Peter and upon examining them, had them murdered put to death because Peter was freed, and they had allowed it. And then Herod goes to Caesarea Maritima. You saw the images on the screen. This is where we meet him in our text this morning as he enters the area of Tyre and Sidon. And now these are two Gentile cities on the Mediterranean coast in this region. They were trade cities, really. But what I want you to see this morning before we move on is that this region is significant for Old Testament prophecy. In Isaiah 9-1, we read that this was a part of the land that was prophesied by Isaiah uh, when he said a day would come when the Lord would make glorious the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, Galilee of the nations. Isaiah prophesied in chapter 9, saying that the agent of this blessing who brings glory is this. He says, the, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. For to us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder." His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Does this person sound familiar to you? Matthew, the disciple and gospel writer, as he's narrating the life of Christ, he says that it's Christ's life that fulfilled this prophecy. Matthew 4, 13 to 16. He says, Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them has light dawned. Now, Matthew makes it clear for us that this light who dawns upon this land is Jesus. And Christ, that, that true light, he traveled to this region of Tyre and Sidon. Maybe you remember it. Matthew 15, there he visited a Gentile woman who pled with him, heal my daughter. And at her humble display of faith in him as the Christ, Jesus did. And so this region surely knows something of Isaiah's prophecy, surely remembers something of Christ's visit. But on this day, Herod visits them, and it's not a good visit. Herod's angry with these people. They must have been too needy for his liking as the king. But they plead with him for peace because they depended on this king and his country for food. 
And so what does Herod do? He adorns himself with his royal robes that didn't, didn't look like this. Adorns himself with his royal robes, issues his decree, and the people start to worship him, saying, the voice of a God and not of a man. And now Josephus helps us out here, ancient Jewish historian, who writes that, that Herod's robe was made of silver, and that the whole thing shimmered in the light of the sun. And the, the created effect here was to image divine glory. Herod wanted to be seen as from God. In the ancient Near East, pagan temples, the, the doorway into the temple that faced the idols that they worshipped was east, so that when the sun arose, the light would shine into the door, shine on the idols, and illuminate them. But the problem is that that light was reflected light. That glory was reflected glory. Now, the significance of the temple in Jerusalem in Ezekiel's day is that there was a veil between the eastern door and the Holy of Holies. So the glory that emanated from the Ark of the Covenant, you knew properly pertained to Yahweh. It was not reflected glory, it was his own. Here, Herod in Caesarea Maritima before the people is manufacturing glory, but it is reflected glory. It is not his own. And so abruptly in the narrative here, Luke comments the Lord's response. Read it in verse 23. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Now, this scene contrasts so sharply with what takes place at the beginning of Acts 12, which is where Herod has been waging war against the Christians in Jerusalem, killing James along with many others, and now Herod's own blood is spilled. And the image that Luke presents us here with is an image of the Lord who is sovereign over all things. That includes Herod. That includes the martyrdom of those early believers that died at the hands of Herod. The Lord's sovereign over Herod's evil rule. And now the Lord is sovereign over Herod's death. That's what we see. And everyone in this surrounding area would have heard news of what took place as the Lord killed Herod for taking his glory. The glory that the Lord deserved. Now, church, the question for us this morning is, how often do you look upon the state of our world, or the state of our nation, and grieve? You know, I think grief is a proper response to a culture that has rejected the rule of the Lord. But if we're not careful, our grief can devolve in the temptation to view ungodly leaders and the persecution that they legislate as a hindrance to the gospel. But if we learn anything from this passage this morning, it's that there are no hindrances to the gospel. There are no hindrances to the gospel. The opposition of Herod in all of his murderous intent was no hindrance to the gospel. For that matter, neither the imprisonment of Peter or the death of James was a hindrance to the gospel. Why? Because against the backdrop of Herod's spilt blood and James's spilt blood is the spilt blood of Christ, which triumphs over all things. And that signals for the church, us, his people, our ability to trust him in every single circumstance, no matter what it is that you are facing. He is sovereign over all things, his mission included. And Tertullian once commented 
on the persecution and the opposition that he and others experienced at the hands of the Romans. And these were his words. I want you to hear them. He says, the oftener we are mown down by you Romans, the more we grow. The blood of Christians is seed. A church on mission trusts God's sovereignty in all things. Persecution and opposition will not serve to hinder the spread of the gospel. Rather, it will ignite the spread of the gospel. That's what we see in the story of the early church. In Acts 4, 23 to 31, maybe you remember the story. But Peter and John have been jailed because of their healing of the lame beggar, and they're attributing all of the praise and honor to the Lord for the healing. They're thrown in jail, brought before the Sanhedrin, tried, threatened, later beaten. But here they're released from jail. And they go back to their friends, the church. And it's so significant what they do and what they don't do. They don't go back to their friends and complain about their unjust arrest. Instead, they go back to their friends and they pray. And they pray Scripture. And they pray Scripture that is focused on God's sovereignty in all things. I want you to see this. Acts 4, 23 to 31. They pray, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, that's Psalm 143, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's Psalm 2. And then they say, for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Now we get to their petition. Now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. I want to show you a picture of this boldness that comes by trusting in the Lord's sovereignty in the life of John Patton. Maybe you remember him. I've told you about him before. He was a missionary with his wife to the New Hebrides Islands in the South Pacific Ocean in the 1800s. They left Scotland, went to these islands specifically to take the gospel to these unreached cannibalistic islanders, and they dedicated their lives to preaching the gospel in this unreached context. They learned the local language so that they could translate the Bible for these people. And while there, they experienced intense persecution and hardship that ultimately resulted in John's wife passing away, some of his children dying. But in it all, Patton saw the Lord's hand of sovereignty. And he recognized that even when he did not understand what was taking place, God was at work and God was doing things that were best for the Lord's glory, best for him, best for his wife, best for his children. Why? Because they're ushered into the presence of the Lord. But I want you to hear this. I want you to hear his words as he reflects on a life spent pouring himself out in this ministry context, reflecting on the hardships of life, preaching Christ's name among the nations. He says, whatever trials have befallen me in my earthly pilgrimage, I have never had the trial of doubting that perhaps after all, Jesus had made some mistake. No, no. My blessed Lord Jesus makes no mistakes. When we see all his meaning, we shall then understand what we can only now trustfully believe that all is well. Best for us, best for the cause most dear to us, best for the good of others and the glory of God. 
Now, in this very next passage, we're going to see the the impact that takes place through a people trusting in God's sovereignty as He, through His Spirit, works through them. Verse 24, the Word of God increased and multiplied. So, against the backdrop of Herod's opposition and eventual death, Luke describes the gospel as going forth. It was not hindered. And so, church, the question for us this morning is not, will the Word of God increase in the midst of opposition? The question is, will you allow the opposition that you experience to hinder your participation in the Lord's kingdom work in our community and around the world? That's a question that we as a church, but also as individual members who make it up, have to ask. We must persevere with the strength that the Lord gives us and the confidence knowing that God is sovereign over all things, His mission included. And so, as you seek to testify to the goodness and grace of the Lord in the gospel, to your co-workers, your family, your friends, your neighbors, whoever it may be that the Lord has given you, you must trust in God's good and sovereign purposes. In all things and at all times, the Lord's Word will go forth unhindered. And so, as a church, And as a people on mission, we're afforded the ability to trust God's sovereignty in all things. So let us trust Him this morning. The second thing we see is that a church on mission hears the Spirit's call. We see this starting in verse 25. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. And so, in Acts 9, we learn first of Barnabas and Saul's uh, introduction to one another. So, it was Barnabas who defended Saul before the believers in Jerusalem, testifying that Saul really had met the risen Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus and truly had been transformed. As he came into their midst in Jerusalem, they were worried that he was there to persecute them. Barnabas testifies on his behalf, saying, no, he's now one of us. He's met Jesus. In Acts 11, we learn of the formation of Paul and Barnabas' ministry partnership. Barnabas was sent up from Jerusalem to Antioch when the gospel went to Antioch that he might teach them. And as he arrived and he saw all the need and began teaching them, he realized he needed more teachers. He needed more Bible teachers. And so what did he do? He went and found Saul and brought him up to Antioch with him. And we read in in, uh, 11, 25 to 26, what took place. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. And now maybe you're already on to this, but this is a significant moment in the life and ministry of the early church. Why, if you remember, the church in Antioch was composed of believers who'd been scattered from Jerusalem at the persecution of Stephen. But if you remember, Acts 8 verse 1 teaches us who presided over the persecution of Stephen. Who was it? It was Saul. And so they scatter from Jerusalem. They go north. The gospel comes to the others who are around them. They're worshiping. And then all of a sudden, Barnabas strolls into town with Saul. What do you imagine is going through their minds? Put yourselves in their shoes. Well, for for Saul, something changed. Christ broke into his life, met him on the road to Damascus, blinded him, used Ananias to heal him, filled him with the Holy Spirit, and then commanded him to go and take good news of his salvation to the Gentiles. What changed in Saul's life was that he met Christ. Christ showed up. Church, this is a reminder for each of us that none are beyond Christ's reach. Maybe you're here this morning believing that you are beyond Christ's reach, a lost cause, Or maybe you have people in your life that you've been ministering to, trying to share the gospel with. But even in your own thinking, you just tend to give up thinking, there's no way they're going to respond positively to this message. 
Well, here through Saul, we see no one is beyond Christ's reach. So do not give hope. Don't stop praying. Don't stop sharing the gospel with them. It could be that the Lord planted you in their lives as someone that he would give the strength to endure, to persevere, that they might continue to hear the gospel, repent of their sins, and turn to him. So church, do not give up. In our text now, we see Barnabas and Saul are returning to Antioch. They had to go to Jerusalem to take the relief offering. Now they're coming back. And now is when we get a glimpse of the makeup of the church in Antioch. We read in 13 verse 1, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now we know Barnabas, leader of the church of Jerusalem, sent up to Antioch to teach. Maybe you don't know Simeon the Niger, though. His name indicates that he is from the area of Africa that the Greek-speaking world called Ethiopia. And this is significant because Ethiopia is the land that the Old Testament calls Cush. And as Simeon is here involved in the life and ministry of the church in Antioch, we're going to see something really interesting in the story of Acts. His presence is immensely important because one of the brightest threads woven throughout the entirety of Acts is the story of the reversal of the curse at Babel. At Babel, when the Lord confused the people's language because of their sin and scattered them throughout the whole earth, we see that that event took place because of the pride of one family, one people group. That's the Cushites. And in, in Acts 2, at Pentecost, you get this massive list of all these people who've been brought into Jerusalem for Pentecost. And you may be tempted to view it as a complete list. Uh, this is the Lord now bringing all of his people from all the nations of the world together. But it's not. This is an incomplete list because notably, the Cushites are absent. There's a delayed in gathering of the Cushites that we see take place in Acts 8 through the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. You remember the story where Philip met him on the road from Gaza to Jerusalem as he was reading Isaiah the prophet, and Philip was used by the Lord to share the gospel with this guy he becomes a believer, wants to get baptized there on the spot. The Lord provides water in the desert to baptize this guy. And then he goes on his way rejoicing. That Acts 8 moment as this Ethiopian eunuch is baptized and converted, what we see is this is now the Lord signaling the full and gathering of his people from all the nations. But now, Acts 13, we see there's a person from this area in the church at Antioch that the Lord is using as a leader in the church of Antioch. This signals the fulfillment of Zephaniah's prophecy that a day is coming when the Lord would change the speech of the peoples to a, a pure speech, that the daughters of his dispersed ones would bring their offering, even the Cushites, he says. That's what we see through Simeon. His presence and the leadership at this church shows us now God is bringing in people from all the nations. We see Lucius. He's from North Africa. We see Menaean, who is a friend, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. This was the Herod who conspired with Pontius Pilate to kill Jesus. And then finally, we get to Saul. Enough has been said about Saul. Trained by Gamaliel, a Pharisee of the highest order, a persecutor of the church, but one who met Jesus. If there ever was, church, um, proof of the Holy Spirit's power to unify a church, it's the unity that we see here in the church at Antioch. Do you see that this morning? Across this background of diversity, we see there was unity in this church but the question is asked, what seems to drive their spirit-given unity? 
And you notice in this passage, it's very clear. It's their worship for the Lord, and it's their participation in His mission. Church, that's the source of their unity. There are a million issues over which they and Antioch could have divided, a million issues over which we here at Central could divide. But what we learn in this passage is that these secondary issues should give way to our worship for the Lord and the mission that He has called us to participate in. Not because He needs us, but because He desires to use us for the spread of His name and fame. That's what we see here. In verse 2, we read, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And the first thing you'll notice about this is that uh, the work of the Lord in this passage, the work of the church in Antioch, was born out of worship. That's what they were doing. It is our worship for the Lord, for who He is and what He's done, that our gospel work is occasioned and evoked. John Piper has argued that missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. He argues that worship is the goal and the fuel of missions. Worship is the goal of missions because it is our aim in missions to bring the nations into the white-hot enjoyment of God's glory. And he says worship is the fuel of missions because we cannot commend that which we do not cherish. The missionary heart of Antioch was born out of worship. And church, for us here this morning, our missionary heart burns only in so far as our worship for the Lord burns. Let us be a church who worships the Lord. And let this be for us a, a moment of reflection for ourselves collectively, but also as individuals. If we find within ourselves a lack of desire to make Christ's name known here in our community and among the nations, It's not a work problem. It's not a commitment problem. It's not a missions problem. It's primarily a worship problem. Our worship is what drives our gospel proclamation. You see, in the midst of their worshiping and fasting, that's when the Holy Spirit speaks, saying, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And now Acts 9 tells us a little bit about this specific work. As the Lord says uh, to Saul in person, to Ananias, to others, that Saul has been set apart to take the gospel to the Gentiles. So when the Holy Spirit comes in Antioch, he says, this work that is provided for Saul and Barnabas, for which I've set them apart, is to get the news of Christ's salvation to all the nations, all the people who do not know His name. That's the reason they were set apart. And now the temptation for us this morning can be to view the gospel going to all the nations as a New Testament paradigm. But what I want us to see this morning is that from the Old Testament, Back to the days of God's covenant with Abram, the Lord had already articulated His desire to bless all the families of the earth. That's Genesis 12, 1 to 3. In Genesis 2, uh, 22, 16 to 18, the Lord identifies one individual male offspring who will come from the line of Abraham who will be God's agent of blessing for all the families of the earth. The New Testament authors read back the, old, the Abrahamic covenant and identify Christ as that seed from Abraham. Meaning that even in the Old Testament, from the very beginning, God's desire was that all the families of the earth be blessed through Christ. So this is not a New Testament paradigm. This is now where we see that promise being fulfilled. 
as they go. And during their ministry in Acts 13, 47, uh, they've been sent out from Antioch and they arrive in a different Antioch in modern day Turkey. And now they're called to defend themselves and their ministry to the Gentiles as the Jews in Antioch of Pisidia revile them. And I want you to hear their words. Paul and Barnabas respond with this. They say, for so the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light to the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, what's so significant about this passage is that what Paul and Barnabas are doing is simply quoting the Old Testament. That's Isaiah 49, 6. So Paul, standing before the believers in Antioch of Pisidia, as they say, why are you going to the Gentiles? He could have said, Jesus met me on the road to Damascus and told me to go. And he would have been justified. He could have said, the Holy Spirit showed up at our church meeting in Antioch and told us to go. And he would have been justified. But instead, what does he do? He turns to the Old Testament and says, we're taking our marching orders from the book. And I think that was to signal for us the ability not to necessarily rely on an in-person conversation with Jesus or an in-person command from the Holy Spirit to go to the nations. Instead, Paul's saying, your basis for this work is here. You've got it. I spoke these words long ago through the prophets, through the covenants. Now I'm giving you my son. That's what we see here in this passage. They quote Isaiah 49, 6, identifying Jesus in his ministry, the spirit in his ministry, but also the testimony of the word of God as that which propels us to gospel work in the community and the world. Church, I hope you see that this morning. This is such an encouragement, but also a deep challenge to each of us. The overwhelming message of the book of Acts is that it's not the ministry of a few to take God's salvation to the ends of the earth. It's the ministry of all Christ's followers. We're all called to participate in one way or another. But church, first, we must hear the Spirit's call in missions. And third, finally, we're going to see that a church on mission prioritizes Christ's commission. We see that in 13.3. It says, After fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Now, the first thing that we'll notice here is that the Spirit speaks in the context of the gathered church. But what are these people doing? They're doing what they had been doing from the very beginning, which is worshiping the Lord and fasting. That's what we see. And now this final verse is filled with verbs. And to do a, something of a grammar lesson real quick and risk all of you hating me for the rest of the time we're in here, but bear with me. Grammar is important because it helps us understand the thrust of God's word. There are a lot of verbs in this final verse, but you see the vast majority of them are adverbial participles. What does that mean? It, it means simply that they're describing the main action, but they are not themselves the main action. There's a controlling verb in this passage. That controlling verb is sent them off. And so that's the verb that in this passage should receive all of the emphasis. What was the church in Antioch doing? Well, they were sending. Now, these other verbs, what they do is they help us understand the nature of Antioch sending, what it was that they were doing. So how were they sending? They were fasting. They were praying. They were laying their hands on these men and then, controlling verb, sending them off. And you can read in Acts 13 and 14 what takes place on this first missionary journey. They witnessed many major ways that the Lord worked in taking his gospel to the people who did not yet know the Christ. But we also see that they endured a lot of persecution. But this is what I want you to see is that the church in Antioch wasn't only involved in the sending them out, 
The church in Antioch was involved even in the time that they were out ministering by continuing to pray, continuing to support, continuing to advocate for them. We know that because we see that the way the church in Antioch received them back when they returned home. Acts 14, 26, as they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled, and when they had arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and they remained no little time with the disciples. What we see here is that the church was intimately involved in the process, even though they weren't the ones being sent out. That's a challenge for us here to continue to learn how we can be a part of God's global work around the world, even when we're not the ones being sent. Christopher J. H. Wright says, it's not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world as that God has a church for his mission in the world. Mission was not made for the church. The church was made for mission, God's mission. So what does this mean this morning for us collectively as a church? It means that every single one of us are called and privileged to be a part of it. John Piper has identified four different options for responding to this call. You can pray, you can send, or you can go. The only other option is to disobey. Church, for us, that, that's the reality that we are presented with this morning. As we're invited to participate in God's global kingdom work, our options are, oh, we'll be praying, or be sending, or be going, but just don't be disobeying. Church, again, may it be said of us that we are like the church in Antioch, that we obeyed, that we sent, that we prayed. Pray for the general work of missions. Jesus himself commanded his disciples, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We need to be praying. Pray for our missionaries that we have right now around the world. You can pray for our short-term mission trips that are coming up. Those are all ways that we need the church gathering together committed to this act of participating in God's global work. It begins with praying or sending, being a part of helping send those who are willing to go out onto the field. That could be by helping them with resources, helping provide for them financially, getting them onto the field, getting them training they need, helping with the logistics to raise their support here, helping them even with the, the process of arriving in country, securing visas, all that. You can be a part of sending. Or you can be a part of going. That could be being mobilized to partner with our local ministry partners here in, in uh, Memphis and Collierville. Maybe it's joining one of our short-term mission trips. Or maybe, even as you sit here today, you've sensed the Lord working on your heart, loosening your roots to, to be committed to full-time cross-cultural missions. And you're here today with us this morning, but a couple years from now, you're gone, ministering somewhere around the world. Don't say to yourself now in this moment, yeah, that's not me, because it very well could be. I doubt Saul was saying, uh, I bet Saul was saying to himself, yeah, that's not me. I'm not worshiping Christ. But what did Jesus do? Showed up and transformed his life. There's any number of things that God might want to do with us as individuals, but also us as a collective body here at Central. Let us be praying. Let us be sending. Let us be going. But church, let us not be disobeying. Let us be a people who join Christ's work in missions, recognizing that we each have a role to play and that each of those roles are vitally important to what we see taking place in the ministry of those who go. 
Let us be a church that prioritizes God's work among the places that do not have access to the gospel by prioritizing Christ's commission. And so for us this morning, three quick application points. First, pray. Be pray- or Actually, first, um, reckon yourselves as participants in God's global mission work. Recognize that you've been called to participate in, a, in one way or another by praying, sending, or going. Second, make it a habit, a weekly habit of praying uh, for the work of missions around the world. You can go to Central's website, see the list of missionaries that we have, pick one of them each week and pray all week in your devotional time for those missionaries and that the gospel would spread through them and their work. Come up after service and grab one of these wristbands on the stage or at the exits, uh, which have the names of the places that we'll go on our short-term mission trips this summer. Pray for those teams. Pray for their work as they go. And finally, this week, I want you to read Acts 13 to 14. Read about the things that take place on Barnabas and Saul's first missionary journey. See that the way the Lord called them, provided for them, and worked through them to bring the gospel to those who did not know it. You're going to read in Acts 13, the Gentiles rejoiced. Read that this week. But read these verses through the lens of God's sovereignty, the Spirit's call, and the prioritization of Christ's great commission. Pray with me this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for our time spent here in your word. Father, we thank you for the gift that it is to us, but we ask even now that on account of our time spent in your word, God, that you would shape us by it, that we would be people of the book, but Father, that our lives would begin to represent more and more with each day that passes the lives of someone who trusts in your sovereignty, hears the Spirit's call, and prioritizes your son's commission. I pray that for myself. I pray that for all my brothers and sisters in this room. God, would you do that work among us? Father, we are weak, and we desperately need your spirit to do this work in us. And so that's our prayer. But Father, we know that you are faithful and just to answer these prayers. That's your promise. And so even this morning as we pray, we recognize, God, our neediness before you, But God, we also recognize your provision of the Holy Spirit to do this great work in us. And Father, over the course of this next week, we pray, would you continue to mold us into people who look more and more like your son? Every day would we grow to love him more and resemble him more. We pray all of this in his name, the only name that we worship. Amen.